The Central Church of Christ is a family-oriented congregation that believes that Jesus the Christ is the head of the church and that the Bible is right. We're comprised of a group of committed, imperfect people who are striving to walk with our Lord and Savior. Yes, Sundays at Central make a difference, but we want to ensure that we're impacting your daily lives. We're dedicated to making a difference, not only in the lives of our church family, but also in our surrounding communities. Central offers several classes, ministries, and programs for people of all ages that we're confident will fit your needs. We'd love to show you why our congregation is the right church home for you. So stop on by and join us for worship service so that you can experience how Sundays at Central make a difference. Welcome to Central Church of Christ, where Sundays at Central make a difference. For those online, uh, viewing online, the hashtags will be relationships and hashtag faith. Once again, that's hashtag relationships and hashtag faith. Now, uh, Brother Williams and I are going to do some tag teaming here. I hope you all are with us. Uh, that chicken weighed me down, too, so <laughs> I'm glad I got some help this afternoon. I love to praise him. I, I love to praise him. I love to praise him. Oh, I, I love to praise his name. I love to praise him. Yes, I love to praise him. You know that I He's a Jew, he's a 
worship time together. Thus we are thankful to God and of course those who may be joining us by phone online we thank God for you as well. As we prepare ourselves for the afternoon worship as the man of God will come before us and give us the word we ask that you will prepare your hearts but before we do want to thank all of our uh, workers who have just put all of this together for us. The food was good. Say amen if you can. Amen. amen. And of course, we are thankful for all those who made the effort to have food, the arrangement at the hotel on, uh, yeah. that was Friday and Saturday and then today. And so we are grateful for that as well. Good to have Brother William with us singing today, amen. Always welcome with us. Thank Brother Jones. Well, let's get down to business right quick, amen. We are grateful because he, the man of God, did an outstanding job today in the person of Brother Brian Moulton. And we're glad to have he and his wife with us, and they've been with us all week long. So he's going to bring us the word of God. He is the minister for the Goose Creek Church of Christ. As I said, it's just interesting every time I say it, Goose Creek, because it reminds me of no other name that you have for supermarkets like Piggly Wiggly. Yeah. <laughs> All of that stuff that goes together. So we are thankful to him. He's going to bring us a word as he did on today and talking about the family. And there is nothing like the family of God. We're going to ask our brothers to give us one more song, then the next voice you will hear. The minister for the Goose Creek Church of Christ, where he has preached the word of God for 20 years and known throughout our brotherhood as in their marriage support system to encourage families to stay together. Let's put our hands together and welcome the preacher, Brother Moulton, as he's going to come and bring us the word. Let's stand together. I'm gonna trade my earthly home for a better one. Pride and fear will rise and left to bear a mansion for children in the air. I'll join her in that land which is no sorrow can be found. When I see a mansion, a mansion roll, well. This has really been a whirlwind 
of a time, but it has been a pleasure, a joy, and forever memorable. We are grateful to God for making available this time that we might fellowship, uh, encourage, and certainly strengthen the home front. How many of you know that the devil is busy? And the devil seeks to steal, kill, and to destroy. Jesus said, but I've come that you might have life and might have it more abundantly. And so while the devil is trying to steal, kill, and destroy, Jesus have come that we might have that abundant life. And so we want to let God have his way and have his say as we study God's word and allow him to direct our hearts. As I've said before, and I'll keep saying, until the day the Lord called me home, I am everly and eternally grateful to Brother Rupert and this wonderful congregation for the love that each and every one of you have shared. Uh, certainly want to uh, uh, celebrate our song leader there, Brother Williams, amen, somebody. Uh, and our other brother did, did a great and fine job. Uh, and the whole uh, group of Christians that really exemplify Christ. It's good to see uh, Brother Preacher uh, Goodwin, Goodman here. A amen, somebody. Grateful to God. Always good to see him. I've known him for years in passing, and so we're two ships in the night, but it's always good to see a familiar face. Uh, we're living in times where you don't see uh, as many sound gospel preachers uh, as we would hope that they are on the battlefield. But uh, the Lord is with us and there's always a remnant and we continue to press on for the high calling of God in Christ Jesus. Now, as was mentioned, you have eaten at least three times today. You see, you ate at Bible study, you ate at worship service, you went downstairs and had some chicken, ate again, and we're going to feed you one more time. And so it is our prayer and it is a blessing to be able to double dip, triple dip, quit dipple dip, amen, and then go home and dip on out. Now, uh, in 1 Corinthians chapter number 13, 1 Corinthians chapter number 13, commencing at verse number 4, I know that you have it in your copy of God's divine word. I want to reiterate the text that have been read into your hearing. Listen to your Bible. The Bible reads thus, love suffers long and is kind. Love does not envy, love does not parade itself, is not puffed up, does not behave rudely, does not seek his own, is not provoked, thinketh no evil, does not rejoice in iniquity, but rejoices in the truth, bears all things, believes all things, hopes all things, endures all things, love never fails. But where there are prophecies, they will fail. Where there are tongues, they will cease. Where there is knowledge, it will vanish away. Let all those who believe in agree say amen to the reading of the word. Now, whether you're in the body or not, if you've been married, if you have gone to the altar of holy uh, matrimony, wherever you got married, chances are great you have heard this text. A amen, somebody? This is a familiar text uh, that is oftentimes read uh, at the inception of uh, your matrimony. But what's interesting about this text is uh, we oftentimes have selective hearing, selective memory. We remember the good parts of this text. We love love suffers long. We love that love is kind. Then you skip on down and you remember bears all things, hopes all things, believes all things, endures all things, and love never fails. Uh, but sadly, we're living in a time where it is the absence of love that is more commonly displayed than love itself. When you think about uh, getting married and thinking about our lives uh, with one another, uh, amen, till death do us part, who among us would desire a spouse who behaves rudely? We don't sign up for that. Uh, who would marry a spouse that rejoices in iniquity or is puffed up in pride or is easily provoked? On this evening, I'd like for us to consider for a subject for better or for worse. For better, saints, or for worse. Now, oftentimes, particularly when we talk about uh, traditional vows, and we uh, a lot of times see uh, couples write their own vows, and their own vows have nothing to do with the reality of love itself. It just sounds good, amen, when you come together. But when you think about traditional vows, wedding vows, it sounds a little bit like this. I 
Eugene L. Elroy, take you, bum Quisha, to be my lawfully wedded wife, to have and to hold from this day forward, for better, you can help me if you want to, for worse, for richer, in sickness, to love and to cherish till death do us part. When I think about the traditional vow, vows, they are often rooted in scriptural descriptions of the seriousness of the covenant union of marriage, uh, particularly the to death do us part and for better or for worse. When you look over there in Romans chapter number seven, in Romans chapter number seven and verse number two, listen to your Bible. Paul says, for the woman who has a husband is bound to the law of her husband as long as he lives. But if the husband dies, she is released from the law of her husband. So then if while her husband lives, she marries another man, she will be called an adulteress. But if her husband dies, she is free from that law so that she is no adulteress, though she has married another man. And so we certainly uh, understand as long as he lives. We understand the covenant union and the expiration date of when couples come together. And it is God's plan for man and woman to unite until death do us part. When I look over there in Matthew chapter number 19 and verse number 6, listen to the words of Jesus. Our Lord and Savior says, So then they are no longer two, but one flesh. Therefore, what God has joined together, let not man separate. I want us to think about weddings. Oftentimes, weddings are scheduled in wonderful times and seasons of life. You have weddings scheduled in uh, the spring or uh, the summer. I want us to connect with the reality that while weddings may be seasonal, marriage is not. Is there a church in here? Spouses are to remain married in the winter as well as in the spring times of life. We must learn to accept marriage in sickness as well as health, for poorer as well as richer, for worse as well as better. You do not get divorced because your spouse is sick or injured. You do not get divorced because you fell on hard times financially or lost your home. You do not have to get divorced even if infidelity happens in your covenant union. When I think about worse, amen somebody? I think about Will Smith and Jada Pickett Tupac. Uh, uh, Jada Pickett Smith, a amen. The reason I bring them up, amen, facetiously certainly, uh, is because of how they describe their own marriage. They use the term brutiful, which is a combination word. It both brutal and beautiful at the same time. This is a marriage that is for worse. When I think about worse, I think about Abigail and her foolish and scoundrel of a husband named Nabal. If you recall over there in 1 Samuel chapter 25 and verse number 3, the Bible lets us know that uh, uh, Ab uh, Abigail was a woman of good understanding and beautiful appearance. But Nabal, the Bible described, was harsh and evil in his doings. And so we have a couple here whose marriage seemingly is one of chaos living with that kind of spouse, Nabal, a man whose name means fool. But if you uh, read the rest of the story, you discover that in due season, God delivered Abigail, sisters, you missed your shout, from such a difficult life, amen, and blessed her to marry David, a man after God's own heart. And so if love never fails, and according to Colossians 3 and 14, that love is the bond of perfection, then we need to learn, church, how to love. Amen, somebody? The theme over our relationship uh, seminar this past weekend is love is. 
uh, I heard someone say, I love you, but I'm not in love with you. I want us to recognize that many times when people say those things, they really don't know what love is in the first place. Too often times we use secular slogans to describe spiritual concepts. And so I want to describe what love is and help us understand, amen, God's descriptive. Love, number one, is a decision which we've made and keep by covenant. It is decision or choice. Now, a lot of times couples act like you didn't choose your spouse, but you did, amen, to enter the sacred union of marriage. It must be maintained. This choice that I'm talking about. It's like obeying uh, the gospel, a amen, uh, which is not just the initial in uh, reception of the good news of Jesus Christ, but it is a continual commitment and devotion to the Lord. Give us an example. If you consider Galatians chapter number five and verse number seven, the Apostle Paul says to the saints there in Galatia, he says, you ran well. Who hindered you, here it come, from obeying, I-N-G, the truth. He's writing to the saints who are, if you're a child of God, if you're a saint, you've already obeyed the gospel. But he's saying, who hindered you from obeying the gospel, which tells us that the obedience, the obeying, is a continual commitment and devotion uh, to the Lord. And so unlike the saints in Galatia, we must continue to choose to love our spouses. Amen, somebody? This decision finds relevance, particularly when spouses fail to get along. Love, number one, is not so much as a feeling, a feeling as it is a decision. Christ, amen, husband of his bride, the church, amen, uh, loves us even when we are disrespectful and disobedient to him. And so when we look at the relationship between Christ and the church, and you consider our relationship with our spouses modeled off of that, amen, relationship, we must likewise keep our commitment to one another, which means we have to love when she's moody. Amen, somebody? I ain't gonna get no help. Love when she's moody. Love when he raises his tone. Love when she's unapproachable and unattractive. Love when he forgets to come home. Love when she's disrespectful to your person and your manhood. We must learn to love the periodic disunity out of our unions. And so uh, oftentimes when we have uh, dysfunction in our marriages, there are some couples who waste energy developing destructive rather than constructive patterns in marriage. And so they have a tendency of becoming an expert on how to push one another's buttons rather than developing the expertise to bring peace, joy, and reconciliation to their union. When we talk about what love is, love is also an action word. It is a word which seeks daily expression in word and in deed. Loving expressions, amen somebody, are necessary reminders which, sure, which uh, serve as constant companions in our marriages. One of them, kindness. Kindness is a fruit of the Spirit in Galatians 5 and 22. Lo uh, kindness is a virtue in 2 Peter chapter 1 and verse number 7. If you recall over there in Acts 26, uh, 28 and verse number 2, the Bible lets us know that when Paul, as a prisoner along with other prisoners, was heading to Rome, a amen, their ship ran into a fierce storm called an Eurachlodon. And the Bible lets us know that eventually the ship ran aground, broke pieces, and they had to swim to the island. But also the Bible lets us know that the natives on that island of Malta showed Paul and his shipwrecked companions, here it come, unusual kindness. 
And so when we think about these, amen, natives, not knowing who Paul is, not accustomed to the, uh, the foreign uh, 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 people that come their way, they still understood kindness and were able to show that to Paul and the other prisoners. And so if that be the case to a stranger, should we not show unusual kindness to our spouses? One of the things we have to recognize is that we have a tendency of being kind when we want to curry favor. We, we know how to smile when you want something. Amen, somebody? Uh, but we have to be lovingly kind, not just in word, uh, but in deed and daily. When we think about what love is, love, amen, its priority is to care and be considerate concerning the welfare of your spouse. In other words, we have to learn to deeply identify with our spouses to the extent that their discomfort is your discomfort. A amen, somebody? A amen. So we have to get to the place where we're operating as one organism, uh, one flesh, husband and wife. This is the essence of one flesh. In Philippians chapter number two and verse number four, Paul in this prison epistle, Paul says, let each of you look out not only for his own interests, but also for the interests of others. And so we have to learn how to love. We've got to learn how to prioritize our spouses over all others. In other words, we need to make room in our lives for our spouses uh, to the intent of making their life better. Amen, somebody? Love is the vehicle also to companionship. And companionship is an integral part of God's design for marriage. In Genesis 2 and verse number 18, and the Lord God said, it is not good that man should be alone. I will make him a helper comparable to him. Herein we discover that there is companionship with marriage. When we talk about companionship, we are talking about relationship, we're talking about friendship, we're talking about support, we're talking about closeness. Amen, somebody? In 1 Corinthians chapter number 11 and verse number 8, Paul says, in regard to this uh, companionship, Paul says, for man is not from woman, but woman from man, nor was man created for the woman, but for the man. And so Genesis 2.18 speaks specifically in regard to Adam, the man, in terms of this companionship. But how many of you know women need companionship as well? When we look down in verse number 11, the Bible says, the wife, uh, amen, the Bible says, nevertheless, neither is man independent from uh, woman, nor woman independent from man in the Lord. And so we both need that companionship that the covenant union of marriage provides. When I think about Eve, y'all, Eve, amen, God said it's not good for man uh, to be alone, so he created a woman, amen, and the first woman was Eve, and Eve, or all women, are pers uh, perfectly suited for man and man for the woman. We have what's called physical needs, amen, somebody? We have emotional needs. We have spiritual needs needs. And so spouses must be or should be conscious of each other's needs and strive to the intent of purpose to routinely meet those needs. But at the same time, we have to be of one heart and one heart in terms of one flesh. Couples must strive to attain one will. In other words, becoming one with God and one with each other. And in order to maintain this type of union in this covenant, we each must learn how to deny ourselves. And so Paul puts it like this in Galatians 2.20. Paul says, I, I have been crucified with Christ. 
Nevertheless, it's not I that live, but Christ that liveth in me. And the life that I live, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave his life for me. And so Paul understood crucifixion. Paul understood, amen, the surrendering of individual rights. Jesus in the Garden of Gethsemane, Jesus says in Luke 22 and 42, amen, he says, not my will, but what? Your will be done. And so the idea is that when we deny ourselves by allowing God's will to be done in our life, it is then that we become better spouses to one another. Amen, somebody? Turn your Bible, if you will, to Colossians chapter 3. In Colossians chapter number 3 and verse number 12. In Colossians chapter 3 and verse number 12, just imagine, saints, family, uh, marital couples, imagine if these eight attributes were or are indicative of your marriage. What eight attributes? Here it comes. Therefore, as the elect of God, holy and beloved, imagine if this was part of your marriage, put on tender mercies. Amen, somebody? How about this? Kindness, meekness, long-suffering, bearing with one another, forgiving one another. If anyone has a complaint against another, even as Christ forgave you, so you also must do. Verse 14, but above all these, he says, put on love, which is the bond of perfection. In other words, love is going to hold everything together. And so when you think about uh, being a companion spouse, imagine being the companion spouse to the apostle Peter. Consider Paul's uh, statement in 1 Corinthians chapter 9 and verse number 5 where uh, Paul says, do we have no right to take along a believing wife? as do the other apostles, the brothers of the Lord, and Cephas, who is Peter. Imagine, sister girl, if you will, uh, could you support uh, Peter and God at the same time? Consider if you, being his wife, would you help or would you hurt the work of the Lord? You know, Peter had to travel, and Peter was dealing, amen, with his father's business, uh, think about these particular couples, uh, amen, and whether or not they were of one heart. What I'm suggesting is that Peter and his wife were of one heart, and we need to be of one heart as we are one flesh with our spouse. Consider Lot and Sister Lot in Genesis 19 and 26. And you remember that as they were led out of Sodom and Gomorrah, uh, the one command was not to look back. And you remember, Sister Lot, look back. Jesus says, remember, Luke 17 and 32, what? Lot's wife, amen. And so when you consider one heart and one will, they were one flesh, but were they of one mind? It appears certainly inferred that she looked back to Sodom and Gomorrah with longing. And as a result, she turned into a pillar of salt. Consider Nabal and Abigail, which we mentioned before. In 1 Samuel 25 and verse number 20, uh, verse number 3 and following, you all know the story. David comes and shows some kindness, amen, to Nabal. And uh, Nabal turned up his nose to uh, David, and David was ready to go to war with all the men of that village, uh, amen, and David said, amen, may the Lord do to me and more so if any of them are living, amen, when I come through. But here comes Abigail, and Abigail intercedes and wins the heart of David and protects the village, amen, while Nabal was having a drinking party. Now, were they of one heart? I would suggest to you that just like Lot and Sister Lot, they were not on one accord. Just like Nabal and Abigail, they were not of one accord. What about Ananias and Sapphira? 
You remember that in Acts 5, 1 through 10, uh, these are they that uh, sold the property and, and brought the proceeds, amen, as if what they brought was all that was sold. And as a result, amen, uh, Ananias and Sapphira, they both died. The question is, were they of one heart, one will? Let me suggest to you that they absolutely were. It was not a good thing, but they were on the same page. And sadly, because they were on the wrong page, they both died. Consider Aquila and Priscilla. Amen, somebody? In Romans chapter 16 and verse number 3 through 5, you know, these are great servants of the Lord. You remember, these took Apollos aside and taught them more accurately the word in Acts 18 and 2 through 3. Uh, the question is, were they of one heart and one mind, even as they were one flesh? The answer is yes. They were ministering together for the Lord. And so the question is, amen, uh, for better or for worse. We want our marriages to be for better. And so we have to learn how to sacrifice. We have to learn how to um, consider, a amen, uh, the other even more than yourself. We have to learn what love is. We have to recognize that we have to fight for our marriages. We have to love and allow God to help us, amen, to, uh, amen, be patient. I was telling somebody earlier that the Bible uh, says over there uh, in James, amen, in James chapter uh, number, uh, let's see, where is it at? Yes, uh, in James chapter 1 and verse number 4, the Bible says, uh, verse number 2, my brother encountered all joy. Y'all know the text. When you fall into diverse or various trials, knowing that the testing of your faith produces what? Patience. But then he said, let patience have its perfect work. The problem we have oftentimes is that we don't like to wait because waiting don't seem like it's working. But the Bible said, let patience have its perfect work. And so in our marriages, we're going to have to be patient with one another, even as God is being patient with us. You're not going to be what you need to be overnight. Thank God he's patient with us. Thank God he's long-suffering. Thank God for his grace. Thank God for his mercy. Thank God that he's working with me that I might be a, more, a better version, not of me, but of Christ. Amen, somebody. And so we have to understand the virtue of for better or for worse. You got to hang in there in the winter season of your marriage. Amen, somebody. It ain't always going to be spring. It ain't always going to be rosy. And it sure enough don't always look pretty. But if you hang in there, if you trust in the Lord, if you apply some love, which is the bond of perfection, if you learn how to be kind and meek and lowly, if you let God work on you to, amen, to empty you of you, then you're going to be the best version that you need to be. Isn't that all right? John said, I must decrease, but he must increase. Yes. Amen. We have to recognize that I know it took a long time for you to be the person that you are, but you're going to have to learn to empty yourself of yourself so you can be all that God would have us to be. It is my prayer that something was said for us to consider in regard to our covenant union of marriage so that we might draw closer together and instill the intestinal fortitude to hang in there through the winter season and not trust the process, but trust God. If perchance you are not a child of God, amen, you ought to become one. God and his son, Jesus Christ, hung, bled, and died for your sin and for mine. He was scourged almost to death, bleeding, beaten, unrecognizable, and yet he went up the Via Della Rosa, the, amen, the way of sorrows, bearing his own cross. And when he got to the top of the hill, he couldn't even get it up there. A serene by the name of Simon helped him tear, carry the cross up to the place of execution. And there they put nails in his wrists and they put nails in his feet. They stretched them wide and hung them high that God might display to us what love looks like. 
Love don't look like chocolates. It doesn't look like roses. It's not about opening doors, but it's about sacrificing for one another. And God love you enough to die. I'm trying to tell you that, amen, that, that you're worth dying. Amen, somebody. Sometimes people use the, the term to die for. Well, Christ died for us. Amen, somebody. And, and when we get there, I got a couple questions to ask, but I might not ask them at all. I'll just be glad to get there. But he died. He was pierced in the side, outpoured blood and water. Amen. The blood, the cleansing agent, the water to wash away my sin, all so that I can call his father my heavenly father and be added to the body of Christ, to be a joint heir with Christ, to have my name written, not on the bad credit roster, but on the roster, amen, in heaven. Amen, somebody. You need to have your name written on the right roster if you believe that Jesus hung, bled, and died for your sin and for mine, that he is, amen, not just a prophet, not just a priest, not just the king of kings, but he's the son of the living God. If you understand that and that he died, that we might live. I read somewhere, Romans 2, uh, amen, 3, 23, that all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. Need to remember that in your marriages and the consequence of sin. Romans 6 23 that the wages of sin is death but the gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus and so Jesus did for us what we could not do for ourselves. The gospel is the message of the cross and it talks about the sacrifice of Christ that we might become children of the most high God. If you believe that with all your heart if you're willing to repent of your sin, if you're willing to confess Jesus to be who he declared himself to be, ruler and Christ, amen. If you are willing to be baptized for the remission or the forgiveness of your sin, then we will take your confession, amen, and you will be baptized into the body of Christ and you will become, amen, the bride of Christ. And as God works with you, you need to work with your spouse. And if you're not married, you just have become. If you're subject to the call of Christ, why don't you come? As together we stand and sing. I was sinking deep and sad upon the peaceful shore. Early deeply sang with hand, sinking to rise no more. Again, I want to thank you for welcoming my wife and I to pour into your life in this short period of time. Marriage is a passion of ours, and we're doing everything that we can to strengthen the home front. The problems that we're having in this world and in this nation is that they are moving further and further away from God. But it is the vanguard of the church that must stand up in times like these and show the world that there's nothing wrong with marriage, it's just the people in the marriage. We have to help them understand that God is the manufacturer and when you take it back to the manufacturer, he's gonna tell you how it works. Uh, back in 2018, 
uh, my wife and I, we wrote a book entitled Impacting Change in Marriage. We have a few copies of that if you're interested. I just wanted to throw that out, but we love you with the love of the Lord. Thank you for giving us the opportunity to pour into your life. God bless you and keep you. Greetings, church family. On behalf of the health ministry, I wanted to provide a few tips to keep us all safe and healthy during this flu and cold season, especially with the COVID cases rising. Here are a few precautions. Get vaccinated against COVID-19 and the flu as vaccines are made available. Consume a well-balanced diet of fresh fruits and vegetables. Manage chronic diseases and conditions. Cover your mouth and nose when you cough or sneeze, but never use your hands. Instead, cough or sneeze into a tissue or your elbow. Always throw the tissue in the trash and immediately wash your hands for at least 20 seconds with soap and water. This is one of the most effective ways to prevent spreading germs and getting sick. Of course, if soap and water are not available, use alcohol-based hand sanitizer with at least 60% alcohol to clean your hands. Please continue to monitor your symptoms, and if you don't feel well, stay home and keep your distance from others. Additionally, you should follow up with your primary care provider for further guidance. Wear a mask while in large crowds where there is an increased risk of encountering germs. And when in doubt, Get checked out. Make sure you seek health care when you have any questionable signs and symptoms. Please take care of yourself and others. Thank you. By the love of Christ, I made a vow to give him my life. At the potter's table, on the potter's wheel, mold and shape me, Lord, that I may be filled and live in memory. What you did for me, for me. Oh, yeah. How you set me free, set me free, set me free. At the start count three, yeah. I want to be one of yours. I want to be a worthy vessel, a one that is ready. One that's ready. I want to be used by you. I want to be. I want to be a worthy vessel. Lord, I want to do, do, do just what, what you, you want, want me to. Teach me and show me do, do, truly do, how to love. Do, do, just like that sacrifice do, do, from heaven above. Do, do, Perfect union had never been broken. Stronger words had never been spoken from you. It is finished. Teach me how to finish truly love. A God be love from heaven above. Want to live in memory. I want to live. How you set me free. What you did set me free. Heavenly. Heavenly. I want to be a worthy vessel. Want to be used. One that's ready to be used by you. I want to be. I want to be a worthy vessel. I want to do, do, do. One that's ready to be used by you. Live For me, for me. 
Set me free. Set me free. I want to be. I want to be. I want to be a worthy vessel. Run and red. I want to be a worthy vessel. More.